Very kind of you, and it's such a pleasure also to be here. And thanks to Marit, first of all. You've been the driving force in this seminar, Marit, so thanks. So, uh, which will it be? Well, it, it really depends. Um, we do know the climate crisis we have. Uh, we do know the loss of forests and the loss of wildlife, the land use change. We do know that we're using too much nutrients and messing with the waterways and the coastal areas. And we have, on top of that, the inequality crisis, where some play golf and the rest live in shanty towns and favelas over the world. So, on top of that, we also have this guy, um, particularly making inequality much worse over the last two years. And on top of that, again, we know that the main problem that Jürgen is talking about is caused by the footprints of the richest 10%. So this is a way to illustrate the huge footprints depending on your current level of incomes. And the luxury carbon consumption of the ultra-rich is about, ultra-rich 1% is 15% of total emissions, and the top 10% of the world emit half of all the world's CO2 emissions. So these are interlinked crises. We have a nature under pressure, planetary boundaries in high-risk states, and the wealthy few consuming ever more of the world's material resources. So this is why we do systems analysis. A good starting point is to understand from a systems point of view why the inequality, and particularly the inequality in footprint, has been worsening over the previous three to four decades. Now, this graphic tracks the money flows in the current economic system, and it is a simplification of the total model. But it illustrates that in the late stages of financial capitalism, you have the, the original um, real economy here, where you have the consumers, the households, and the firmers, and the producers, and the demand and supply. This has been somewhat showed to the side due to the impact of the financial sector, or the financialization of the real economy. Uh, the original idea was that wealth would trickle down to the consumers, the citizens, but in reality what we've seen is that wealth is trickling down to the top wealth holders, rather than trickling down to citizens. So how can we change this system of money flows that makes the few rich while polluting the planet and leaving 50% of people in poverty? So this is what we called the five extraordinary turnarounds, which each consist of three main levers or actions, depending on how ambitious you want to be. So the more basic, well-known actions, such as progressive taxation to solve inequality, must be complemented with strengthening worker um, positions and also maybe a universal basic income, or what we prefer to call the universal basic dividend. Energy system efficiency must be food improved, food system efficiency, so we must stop food and waste loss and food waste of food, but also new farming techniques and the changing of diets until we get abundant renewables. And these things go together. So this is why the human mind, with a limited understanding, may need help uh, of a systems model that looks at not just one of these sectors separately, but we look at the interactions of them. Because we have enough reports on energy. We have the IEA, we have Bloomberg, we have Rista, and mother, many others that analyze energy sector. And we have lots of people analyzing the food sector, particularly FAO, and like Eat Lancet, etc. And they specialize in the food sector. We have the UNDP and we, the World Bank that helps work with poverty. We have uh, UNICEF and NGOs working on the empowerment of women and the reports on how important it is to get education and jobs to women. Where there is um, Piketty, for instance, and the World Inequality Database, and also OECD doing great work on inequality. But each area is addressed as if the others don't matter. And that also explains maybe why change has been so painstakingly, so achingly slow. Because most people think that clean energy is a good thing, so is healthy food, educating girls, solving poverty, and reducing inequality. All those are great ideas. Why are they not happening? So one of the exciting novelties in the Earth for All model is that we're looking deeper at how the social and economic and the physical systems interact. 
And here's a deep social dynamic. Let's have a look under the hood of the new model. Uh, this is the high-level view. So first, we know inequality has been going up both within and between countries since 1980s, and it's still rising. More inequality over time causes a decline in social trust, so you're eroding the social capital. This, over time, leads to less stable government. There is more policy stalemates, there's ineffective policies. You have the squibbles in Norwegian parliament that we all know too well. Particularly, there's little agreement on how to reduce inequality of wealth and incomes most of the world. And voila, you get a vicious cycle. The wealthy find ways of not paying their taxes, which worsens inequality, further eroding trust, etc. Now, the coordination, the regulation and the taxation of pollution from the food and the energy sectors, carbon particular, carbon emissions in particular, gets slower. And then this worsens inequality, which then erodes social trust. Less GDP is spent on solving the crisis, more on private consumption, with increasing material footprints. And when the resource and the carbon taxes become regressive, worsening inequality, they hit the poorest hardest, and hence worsens inequality further, like the yellow vests in France, or the agro-industrial logging of rainforest in Brazil and Indonesia, etc. So what this system dynamic overall shows is that the societal response to the interlinked crisis, rather than a rapid transformation, we get stalemate and what we call decision-making as usual. But if we could address inequality, and this seems to be a key lever in the system, then you could turn the vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle. Because if inequality goes down, then social trust goes up, and the speed, so does the speed of public action. This is the key critical loop to fix, and a key uncertainty in our scenarios. Will the five turnarounds be, five, be, sorry, be slow, or will they be fast? And what does that mean in terms of money? We could translate this into money. For instance, investments in renewable energy systems, and this is on the billion US dollars per year. And you can see how if you get a quick uh, turnaround, you get much more investments in renewable energy systems. And then when you're done, the costs come dramatically down. So over time, you have uh, a lot of savings, but in the short term, you need to invest more. So with this, I will turn to the two scenarios. Based on these two different modes of the deep social dynamic, creating either a slow or a fast societal public action on the five turnarounds, we made these two scenarios. You may recognize the picture from the first one, so you may have an inkling about what Jürgen believes. <laughs> so now we need to explain why we make the giant leap a possibility. So, um, in order to visualize this, I will take you on a little journey. Um, we will travel to, um, for instance, Lagos in Nigeria. Um, one key word that we, when you try to do new thinking, you need new concepts. And one of the new concepts I've learned from our African and Asian partners in this project is that we shouldn't really speak about developing or developed countries, but we should speak about uh, the high-income countries and then most of the world. Because that's where the four billion people live that exist on more or less than four uh, dollars per day. So we will visit most of the world. And um, let's say hello to Ayu Tola. There she is, born 2020. Uh, in Lagos, in Nigeria, and um, she's from a poor but working family, we're scraping by, her father drives for a wealthy family, her mother cleans, she has three siblings, food is expensive, cities are congested, family in the UK, some relatives, but airfares are too expensive, so they never see them. Here is Ayatollah's, Ayatollah's life, if we have the too little, too late scenario. So there is drought floods, and food shortages and blackouts already happening in, at increasing regularity, even for the middle class. In the 2030s, 
We can imagine Ayutollah will leave her school at 14 and gets married to the son of a family friend. By 2050, she has four children, and only her boy gets to school. Money is tight, kids are hungry, mass migration to, be, to escape the floods. But it's difficult because there is little trust, a lot of corruption, and violence. By 2080, when Ayutollah is 60, her family have become climate refugees. Extreme weather, as Jürgen said, more than 2.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, creates extreme heat and tropical storms that are common and damage the infrastructure and crops, driving also the price of food in wild fluctuations. Or if the world's governments and the world's businesses and the world's citizens all interact to create a giant leap, how will this life look then? So we start at the same point, droughts, floods, food shortages in 2020. But in 2030, Ayutollah moves to a flat downtown and attends school with her siblings. And by 2050, she's done university and studies now to be an accountant, specializing in well-being indicators. And thanks to governmental regulatory relocation program and a universal basic dividend, she's able to move also out of Lagos. And at age 60, Ayutollah, being a very leading, sharp accountant, is passionate to keep working as a, on the advisory board of Nigeria's multi-trillion citizens fund. Yes? Of course, why don't you want this kind of future? So, what about the US? Um, so to have one from most of the world and one from the rich world, this is Carla, living in Los Angeles, just born, 2020. She has two older brothers, her mother stays at home, father works two part-time jobs, but lost one due to COVID. Now, what we know is that West Coast has the most severe drought and the worst wildfires that's been for a long, long time. And there is more air pollution, wildfire, particles and expensive water coming Carla's way. So she has taught to use water with care. By 2050, she has finished university and started working as an office manager in Seattle because she has to move up the coast, trying to get away from the wildfires and the air pollution. Parents are ill, but they can't afford health care. She has a six-figure student loan and expensive rent. She, in a way, feels like a climate refugee because the fires are coming to Seattle by 2050, and she lives precarious life with paycheck to paycheck. Carla knows, she's, knows she won't be able to retire for a long time at 20, in 2080 because really can't afford to. And she's also become obese due to an unhealthy diet, and she dies of cancer aged 65. Yes? Plausible? Maybe, maybe not. So what if we do a giant leap? Uh, Carla is born, goes to school, and there's still air fire, uh, wildfires and air pollution in 2030, despite new desalination plants coming up along the coast. In 2050, she works as an architect specializing in low energy housing. Her partner is a corruption analyst, and both received their UBD now for 10 years. She and her partner are planning for their first child, and they buy a flat in a pedestrian-only city. At age 60, Carla is able to retire. She still gets the UBD on top of her pension. So in this way, we try to bring these curves of Jürgen alive. And uh, you can also go visit them in Bangladesh. How will Samiha's life become? You can um, see whether she ends up in a settlement camp just outside of Dinyapur, having lost two of her three children by 2080, or whether she is into retirement in 2080 uh, because of a national pension scheme, even in Bangladesh. Or we can go to China and, and say hello to Xu. But in the giant leap, she ends up as a professor emeritus in river ecology and restoring dolphin wildlife to the Chinese rivers. Now, we are going to Stockholm Plus 50, the 50 years anniversary of the Limits to Growth, and we want to have two key interventions to see if we can manage to do something there, and that is to increase the special drawing rights from the International Monetary Fund, particularly to low-income countries. There's a lot of special drawing rights going to rich countries that really don't need them, but the poor countries do need them. The also thing, other thing we want to push is for a citizens fund where uh, we take 
some of the wealth in the nation, put in a citizen fund, and then reduce inequality by universal basic dividend. And all the details are available in this book. You can meet the four girls growing into 2010, sorry, 2100, and also more details about the policy proposals and the system. So with that, thank you.